So a couple of weeks ago, we've skipped the episode, which is like our first time ever since we've been podcasting. And to be honest, like we never really expected to drop an episode every single week. We, we our original plan was we were supposed to just do like, I don't know, like a 15 episode season, then take a one month to two month break and then do another season, do another two to three month break, etc. But it was just, we were just getting so much good feedback from each episode every week that we just decided, you know what, let's just keep dropping this every week. Yeah. Plus and, it was therapy for us. Oh, most definitely. That was hardcore therapy for us. And the week we, we finally skipped and, and it was just, it was unavoidable. It was one of those like, uh, schedules just didn't line up. A co- uh, one of Shoreline had to go off on the field to do another concert and do other stuff that his schedule was demanding of him which absolutely kudos to him because at this time, like last year and the year before that, it was up in the air if their industry will ever recover in the first place. So we're happy to see that he's been jiving and doing his thing and making everything happen on his end. But when we skipped that week, we got so, some fiery feedback as soon as we skipped it. <laughs> and <laughs> some, of, some of our listeners uh, including some of the ones that uh, have hit up MVP personally, <laughs> were like, "Where is my episode? Why did you guys skip? Yo, what the hell?" <laughs> well, yeah, you well, get a head popping over the cube. Hey, what the fuck, man? <laughs> huh? What did I do? Uh, where was the episode? Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Like, oh man, sorry, it didn't work out schedules and that. With, I mean, you know, you have an audience that demands. An episode. I need it. Okay. I need it. It helps me on my drive to work. It gets me through the day. And I'm like, damn, well, thanks for, thanks for being a, a, a listener and a follower. It means a lot. Uh, I will, it, we will do our best in the future to uh, not skip any weeks. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> friend. <laughs> I, I, I deeply apologize. I am sorry. Shame for display, you know, dishonor to you, dishonor to your cow. Cow. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly how I, how I took it. You know, like that's kind of, that's kind of how I felt too. That's it. Dishonor, dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow. <laughs> I'm dishonor sorry. on your whole family. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But honestly, hearing that kind of feedback, it just made my, it just made my day really because when when we thought when we finally had to make the decision like yeah we just can't do it we have to skip this week we think not a beat's gonna be missed like ah whatever no one no one's gonna care that much and then to hear all that stuff like thanks man that means a lot it actually was a it was a really good it was a it was a nice feel good yeah that was great so those listeners out there especially the ones that hit up mvp personally thank you guys so much for listening we really do appreciate it and for all our all all our listeners out there who eventually become patrons, we definitely appreciate you and all your feedback. So if you like our show, please, by all means, join us on Patreon. And then you have access to our private discord where you can interact with us daily, pretty much. <laughs> and, yeah, I'd say. Yeah. So uh, with that said, like we can't predict everything. We don't have like this magic crystal ball that says, oh, on this day at this time, MVP six and shoreline are there the planets are just not going to align and there, there's no way in hell they'll be able to produce an episode or some other project they've been working on. It just doesn't happen. But as far as aviation is concerned, they're trying to figure a way to have that kind of crystal ball where they can predict what's going to be the next thing coming up. And- That's right, everybody. Grab your crystal balls, grab your magic eight balls, grab your eight <laughs> ball of Coke and, uh, <laughs> And try to predict the future. Yeah. Become Miss Cleo. Get, right. Get the magic Sit down conch me, child. From, uh, Miss Cleo will tell you all about your future. <laughs> Isn't that right? Wasn't she like a Jamaican or something like that? I really butchered that accent. Sorry if anybody. Uh, but, uh, no worries, man. Late night infomercials, it's been, huh? <laughs> it's been a hot minute since I heard something from Miss Cleo or anything of that nature. The closest thing I remember is the magic conch from SpongeBob, you know what I mean? It looks it <laughs> oh, looks like magic a magic conch. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a so like a headset for a phone, <laughs> but it's a conch. <laughs> and it tells it's you all, a little drawstring. Magic conch, do we go or stay? I don't know. <laughs> so they just sit there. 
<laughs> that's yeah. kind of what this is, though. I mean, that's exactly what predictive maintenance is. Uh, it's essentially you walk out to the walk out to the plane, whip out your uh, whip out the toolbox, open it up, pull out your your uh, shadowed uh, tarot cards, and start uh, reading the palms of the plane and determining what's going to happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's more or less what is happening but you know okay this is me being spiritual at this point since we're kind of on that subject of astral projecting uh, an aircraft pretty much all aircraft have some form of a soul right maybe not in the astral physical realm of a soul but they really do have like their own personality and part of your our jobs as maintainers is to kind of figure out what that personality is and then we can actually kind of figure out what's going on with the plane it almost wants to tell you what's wrong with it, but it's just a matter of trying to get its personality right. If that makes any sort of sense to anybody, hope I didn't lose anyone at this point. <laughs> but, pre- but predictive maintenance. So, contrary to preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance is the it's this new upcoming theory that a lot of aviation enthusiasts, very smart aviation enthusiasts, are trying to how do I say push for push forward and have it implemented in the field. And what it really involves, it's a, it's kind of like a data collection and analysis uh, exercise. Let's call it that. So it's, it's kind of along the lines of quality assurance, like kind of like how we audit and review processes. But in this case, now it's, we're talking about actual components and using this, data collection and it uses all this fancy math like algorithmic math and you can actually yeah, trend analysis and whatever else right and hey, real quick not to sidetrack you but you had mentioned astral projecting earlier and all i can yeah. think in my head was this is avian ma- aviation maintenance so it's really asshole projecting uh, <laughs> so i don't know why that's stuck in my head sorry for everyone sorry six for getting you off topic there but uh, i just had to get it get it out there asshole no, projecting. I mean, you're absolutely right you're absolutely right it is asshole projecting because it's it's uh it's who can be the bigger asshole sometimes right you know you uh what is it you gotta out out buff or out bluff the the next thing you gotta well, either- talking about assholes it's out boof out boof <laughs> <laughs> gotta out boof it you know when the plane's talking shit you gotta out boof it you know or you gotta stare it into submission <laughs> yeah uh for those of you that don't know what boofing is just just go ahead and look it up yes <laughs> <laughs> i love it but yes tarot cards so Predictive maintenance, what it's tra- what's essentially doing is we're going to take some data collection and we're going to run it through this fancy mathematical algorithm. And it's and by analyzing what it's currently doing real time versus what it's done historically, we can kind of understand a trend of where it's going to go next. Right. So it's kind of like a statistical regression where like this is a chain of events and this is where it's most likely going to happen next basically a crystal ball in math form that's more or less what it's doing well yeah so like let's say right for your motors um you you got your you you got your uh hard data your your uh eek deek you know whatever you whatever whatever you call it on whatever platform you're working but you get that that data that's pulled off that that stores every parameter from the from the engine from and, and you pull the last 15 flights let's say you could say, okay, um, you know, we noticed over 15 flights that our our exhaust gas temp sensors, our EGTs, are are degrading by five percent each flight. Um, so then you get this new motor, and you know, you could okay, uh, we know that we need to change these. We, or we need to develop a, a better EGT sensor, or we need to change our inspection rates um, sooner, whatever else, you know what I mean? Based off that trends alone. So you can say, you know, okay, at, at you know, historically we, we at, at two hour flights, you know, we, we lose 5%, you know, lifespan on our EGT sensors. All right. Well, if that's the case, I'm going up for a 10 hour flight, let's say, um, you know, I expect my, I expect my 
EGT sensor life to degrade to degrade by such a percentage point in that time. If that, if that makes sense, I think I'm on the right path with that, but maybe maybe I'm not. You know, no, I think I think you're I think you're very spot on on this. So it, essentially, yeah, exactly what MVP is saying. Like if we're seeing a trend where it, EGT or engine performance drops at five percent at a certain flight time or a certain altitude time or other factors we can isolate it down to okay these are the these are the top causes for that drop and then we can schedule our maintenance time to either look at it more deeply at better intervals or that's kind of like a sign like maybe we should develop something better or replace it because it's trending towards it's going to fail and right or it's hey because we got to increase the inspection uh the amount of inspections we do on this we're we're driving down you know uh nmc or non-mission capable time and increasing maintenance uh maintenance costs by having to to do these inspections instead of let's say every 200 hours now we're doing it every 100 or or every 50 right depending on the severity of it or whatever the case is so right and and again this is contrary a little bit contrary to preventative maintenance because with preventative maintenance that's kind of like by the by the manufacturer's spe- uh, recommendations like every 100 hours you should do this kind of inspection or every 5 days you should do this kind of inspection and sometimes that's also mandated fe- uh, reg- by uh, some type of federal regulation like you have to do 100 hours or you have to do an annual or something to that effect so with preventative maintenance it's scheduled it's an interval of of a uh, maintenance task that we know we need to do to pr- to ensure the mo- the best optimal lifespan of this aircraft or its components, things of that nature. With predictive, it's it's oh, it's similar to preventative, but it's kind of like it's kid brother, if you want to say. We're like we're getting information real time versus just like okay, let's just check the condition after ten days, right? Or historically, ten days. This is around the time things start to leak or fail or start to show signs of fatigue. So let's just check it in ten days. Whereas we, yeah, you can, you can look at it like, um, well, I guess we call it, you know, depending on, depending on what outfit you work for, but you can call it uh data loggers, white wire data, whatever. I mean that you, you can, you can get real time action and see if something's like legit degrading as your flight is going, is, is progressing. Right. So if you're up for a 10 hour flight and you notice that every hour, you know, you, you keep seeing a, a signal strength uh, or you see or you see a, a temperature rising somewhere as it goes. You get, hmm, I'm I, you know, I've definitely got issues over there as as the time goes on. So I should probably, uh, you know, look into that somewhat. Or you could say, uh, what am I trying to say here? Six, uh, you could you could take your historical trend data that you've downloaded Right, because these new jets, uh, even even the manned ones, I mean they 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 tell you what's wrong with it. Yes, and it's just that good now, where most of them can tell you what's wrong with it. But you can take that, or you can take that historical data and go, "Hey, we're flying along, and this is this issue is degrading." Well, let me go let me go look at some historical records here. Oh, man, there's been a problem with this this AGB seal uh, wrecking itself at 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 400 hours, right? Well, where are we at? Oh, we're at 350. Yeah, we we know we're pretty close to pretty close to this thing actually failing, so we might want to increase change our inspection from uh 400 hours down to 300 hours to change these seals or at least inspect. You know. Yes. Yes. I think I think I'm hitting that right, but maybe yeah. I'm mixing in preventative with it. It still sounds like preventative in my head. Right. I mean, and they kind of work hand in hand, too, because like with preventative, you know, you're scheduling it as intervals, whereas like predictive, we're getting it real time. Like, as you said, like we're getting the data as it's happening. And then we're also getting the historicals of all the previous flights. And that's where we kind of get the, a little bit of a mix up, too, because they essentially do the same thing. But the difference is, is now we have all these different little widgets inside the aircraft or inside this component that can kind of record what's going on as it's happening previous planes now um it was just fly by the seat of the pants like this doesn't sound right or it's like it's making a lot of chatter but 
yeah, it's all right. You know, like it's still working. There's nothing leaking or failing, but what we don't know. We just can't tell because we can't deep dive into it without any risk based reason versus like predictive. It's telling you real time because a lot of these newer planes are pretty smart and they have a lot of advanced diagnostic equipment installed in it where we can figure out or at least figure out to a targeted degree of where the problem's happening. And that's kind of like the reason why a lot of people are advocating for stuff like this is because we we know a lot of knowns, but trying to figure out where the gaps are, aka the unknowns, that's where the predictive maintenance is supposedly supposed to bridge the gap. And this is kind of like their way of saying we're going to transition from just reactive maintenance to preventative where we're ensuring that something doesn't fail and we're knowing real time when it is going to fail or when it can fail. And then likewise, if we're seeing a trend in a string of these planes or a string of these components, now we have relevant objective data to say we need to do this kind of inspection fleet wide or we need to go back to the OEM and figure out where where is this problem being caused at or where is the source of this problem. And that's more or less what the the good part of having something like this kind of data collection and data loggers and being able to see real time where this is happening. Now, <laughs> this is where we kind of have our our uh, our abrasions with this is in order for you to have a good predictive maintenance, you kind of have to have a good preventative maintenance. <laughs> it's it's one of those like. How do we predict the future if our present time is suffering already? <laughs> well, and you also have to have good uh, good records, right? You got to be able to uh, have a good historical archive built up and basically say, "Hey, look at uh, at the past fifteen AGB seals. Twelve of them have all failed within three hundred and fifty to four hundred and twenty five hours." Right? Do the math yes. for whatever that average is, and say, "Okay, we definitely know we need to." We definitely know we need to change our, our replacement cycle of those seals at the 350 mark. Right. And a, another major problem with predictive maintenance is you got to know how to, how to translate the numbers, right? Not just have accurate numbers. You got to know how to translate it. Cause uh, if anyone's ever seen a downloaded data logger or something with diagnostic, it's just a whole cascade of just explosion of numbers, numbers and times and what have you. And if you just look at this at uh, raw, like what the hell does this thing mean? What is it telling me? Or sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll shoot out a chart that says, okay, here's our trend. It goes up, it goes down. It's kind of like a, um, not an ultrasound. What do you call those things where it takes like your heart rhythm? Um, heck, uh, an EKG kind of looks like an EKG. Where it just goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Like, well, what does this mean? Like, is this good? Is this bad? I don't know. Is flatline good? I don't know. <laughs> right. So you got to be able to understand the data. And then you also got to be able to translate that into something you could actually do something with. Right. And that's another part with our abrasion with this, because if you're going through the trouble of analyzing the what this uh, raw data is trying to tell you, or understanding what this chart is trying to tell you, it basically boils down to you're just troubleshooting. It basically it boils down to troubleshooting. Like if you can troubleshoot an, an aircraft as to what's going on, when it's possibly going to fail, when it's possibly going to have issues, you're more or less doing that manually. Now you're just adding a computer into the mix with some math to give you more objective evidence of as to why it's happening. That's really all it's doing at least to us that's a, that's more or less what it's doing like we're our troubleshooting skills are already telling us what's probably going to happen or what's currently happening but now it's backed up by the by the computer or the diagnostic equipment that's installed in the plane or on the component that's backing us up like we think this is we feel that this is happening or we're having we're seeing a trend of this happening and here's the numbers to back it up and as fancy as all that sounds, that's more or less what it comes down to. And not to knock people who are very adamant about this kind of stuff. It's one of those things where like, it's the new, new. 
So it's the new shiny thing. So we got to like jump on the trend. You know what I mean? Well, it doesn't seem like it's that new, right? So, so reading through this article by Honeywell and moving beyond the hype of predictive maintenance is what it's called. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it says aerospace companies have been banging the drum on predictive maintenance for a couple of decades now. Mm-hmm. The promise of a major breakthrough always seems to be just around the corner. Nobody questions the appeal of something that will reduce unscheduled maintenance events, increase technical dispatch, reliability, improve maintenance efficiency, and trim operating costs. But, you know, it says predictive maintenance hasn't lived up to the hype. Yeah, mm-hmm. because as as you can hear us talking, it's not really an easy thing to do, right? How do I predict the future? How do I know? How do I know when that O-ring in the fuel in the fuel pump is going to fail? I, I don't until it does. Yeah. But that's where you just say, OK, uh, how many hours are on this uh, fuel control? Oh, uh, well, uh, see, it was replaced, uh, you know, 250 hours ago. Okay, so was it overhauled? Was it brand new? Like, you, there's a lot of lot of things you got to take into consideration. But then again, your data is only as good as the outfit you work for tracks it. But as we all know, yes. you know, if you work for a major airline, they don't make all the components for that that asset. Um, you know, you got Sunstrand for for fuel controls. You've got Pratt and Whitney for motors. You've got uh, Parker for, for braking systems, you know, uh, it's a whole slew of things. And, and what data are those tracking, right? It'd be handy to know that, Hey, if, uh, Parker's tracking that brake packs are, are overheating or wearing out at a rapid pace due to, uh, whatever composites they're using in their, in their brake pads. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but you might not know that, right? Because let's say you're you're working for an operator and you're only you guys fly, you know, 25 hours a month. You're a, a part 91 or something like that. But maybe you're for a you're for a major airline and you guys are flying, you know, 40 jets and 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 200 hours a day between all the jets or whatever else. Um you know, you, you might not know at that 91 flying 25 hours a month that your brakes are liable to wear out at, at this you know point in the game. Yeah. Um, as whereas the other airlines who reach those numbers faster would. But it is interesting. Honeywell is trying to bridge that gap and they have what they call the Honeywell Forge for mm-hmm. airlines. So what Honeywell is trying to do is combine, take airline, all the airlines data all the uh, depot level vendors um, for these different components, collect their data and put it in one database and sort of smash all the numbers with an algorithm together and basically try to get averages and say, okay, your, you know, your brake packs, uh, we've, we've run the numbers between eight different airlines and, and seven different type models of aircraft that use this specific brake, brake pack over the course of, of uh, 10,000 flight hours. And we've come down to that brake packs are wearing out every thousand hours. Right. You know, oh, okay. Well then I should probably start working on replacing my brake packs at 800 hours, right? Line it up with another, another maintenance event at 800 hours. And that way that'll kind of prevent you from having uh, being broke at the gate, broken the chocks, you know, red ball maintenance, whatever you want to call it. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. You know, by yeah. by aligning these predictive type things with with normal normal scheduled events, yes. normal scheduled maintenance events. Excuse me. Yes. Or uh, uh, as you were talking, like say we know it's gonna possibly fail at a thousand hours or whichever the limit is trending, and at least we have like a predictive lead time. Like we have an idea or it's trending that these things are going to fail at X, Y, Z. So maybe we should uh, start engaging with our suppliers now so we can get replacements. Cause sometimes uh, you don't get the supply. You don't have the supplies in stock. You just, you can only get it like a one for one swap. Like one has to go bad and then they, you get another one sometime in the, in the near future or whatever their lead time is. But if you're having some trends and you can tell by history, like this is going to fail at this time and we're, 
kind of getting close, like that'd be a time like, okay, hey, we need to start engaging with the supplier. So at least they know to get one down the pipe. So by the time it does fail, it's an easy swap. We just get it. We send it off. It comes in the mail or whatever freighter they're using, probably like a couple of day, a couple of hours to a couple of days and we slap it on and it's fine. That's a good thing. But again, like we were saying, like this is all incumbent that the data we're getting is relevant. And then the people analyzing and act doing uh, actionable decisions with this data are actually on point because that's another big problem is while the the components are identifying that there is a problem, it's not necessarily telling you what's causing the problem. You know what I mean? It just says, hey, you have a, a high spike in MGT over here. I'm like, cool. What? Why is that happening? Well, I don't know. It's I'm just telling you what's going on. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and this kind of goes on to the technicians themselves that are on the ground doing this. They kind of have to understand like what the diagnostic is telling them and what sort of probable causes could be giving these problems, right? Like say with the brakes, like, uh, okay, they're overheating. What could cause an overheat? Is the pilot slamming on the brakes too hard? Is the, the pressure that goes into the plates, are they overpressurizing? Whatever the case may be, right? Or maybe it's the tires, maybe it's the weather, who knows? But all we know is that there, therein exists a problem. And then, and then assuming that these components are actually giving relevant data too, because as we know, components fail and even the diagnostic equipment fail. So sometimes you'll get false positives or false negatives. Uh, we've seen this happen with a bunch of aircraft, especially when they're in the experimental phase while they're testing these things. Uh, they once had a time where the aircraft will automatically generate write-ups whenever it experiences a problem. So it sounds cool, but when you start getting write-ups for every tiny little fault that this thing has in the, a bump in the road with, like the the wind blew too hard in one direction and it, it suddenly thought it was starting to roll over. So, oh shit, like start doing a rollover uh, fault isolation and it kicks off a write-up. And so half the time when you when the plane lands, you have to spend all the time clearing all these false positives or false negatives before you actually right. get to the real maintenance. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so, so to put some numbers to that, right. So for that Honeywell forged uh, thing, they kind of employed it with, uh, with an airline um, for the APUs, right. It's kind of a test bed. Yep. And uh, they experienced a 30 to 50% reduction in operational disruptions caused by the APU a 10 to 15% reduction in costly premature removals. The no fault found rate has been re reduced to 1.5% and the service has achieved 99% predictive accuracy. So why I was talking about that is because you were, you were talking about the, the, the cannot duplicate clearing of the red X's or whatever for CND. Um, essentially this, what says the no fault found, like, like you could spend, all right, let's just say you spend, 25% of your time CNDing write-ups or whatever else that the plane is auto generated itself with this predictive, with this predictive method. I mean, they reduced it to under 2%. Dang. Not too bad. That That's pretty good. Especially because like in a previous episode, we were talking about could not duplicate on how that actually hurts the system as a whole, because they say like you have a problem with like we could not duplicate it. We send it back to the vendor or the OEM. And they're like, we can't duplicate it. We don't know what's wrong with it. Like, well, thanks a lot. Like, what do we yeah, do? I just pulled this. I just pulled this damn APU out down the plane for a day and sent it back to you for you to tell me ah, nothing wrong with it. Yep. And that's happened to us a bunch of times too, especially with inverters or other major components. Like we take it off. They test it on the bench. We're like, I don't know what the hell is wrong with it. It's fine here. You go slap it back on the plane and then here pops the problem again. Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. then you, you then you start running into uh let's call it creative troubleshooting where individuals will start doing some real off the wall stuff to try to chase down the problem, like sticking parts in the fridge and shit. And like, <laughs> I don't see how that was ever a great idea, but people have done it. So <laughs> um, yeah, that, that put in there, uh, cool it down, and it should work out better. Well, that's that's fine if you think heat's the problem. But this component also sits in the engine bay next to the motor. And also it's the middle of summer. So uh, how do you plan on keeping it cool 
in flight. Yes. I'll just open I look the, forward to your, thank you. I look forward to your answer. Thank you for your interest in national security. <laughs> right. Just open the engine bay door. It's fine. <laughs> you know, well, there's a cooling duct back there. Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. That'll yeah. Work. Yeah. Because that's for the part. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, I mean, with with this um, new wave of uh, predictive maintenance, it sounds fantastic, especially with the test bed that they worked with with Honeywell's APUs. I mean, reducing C and D to two percent is freaking amazing, and then actually, and then uh, reducing their operational disruption by like thirty to fifty percent. That's fantastic. That could save a lot of money. Again, this goes back to like we have to ensure that the data is clean for one. And then the people who are analyzing this actually know how to read it from the technician on up. Because there are times, too, where well, I've seen some technicians, when they pull the data, they start uh, reacting to this, like, oh, this is bad. We saw a fault or we saw a trend of faults. And then for all we know, it's just the the batteries were dying on this diagnostic equipment or something like that. It's It's ridiculous. And that's kind of far-fetched, but stuff like that has happened. Maybe not necessarily the batteries were dying, but maybe the data loggers were full. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. how many t- how many times have we heard that? Like, oh, the the data loggers they forgot to to erase the or clean out the data from the previous go and then save it to a drive or whatever it is they do with it. So at some point in the middle of a flight, it just got full and stopped recording, and then now we just like we just lost however many hours worth of data as the thing was flying. So. Yeah, or my favorite was, uh, oh, the uh, data is corrupted. Oh, my God. Interesting, because it seems like the fault you landed for was self-induced and not an actual problem with the vehicle. But we wanted to pull the data to see what you did out of sequence. And now it's magically corrupted. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Really interesting. Fancy that. And that's another thing too with this pre- predictive maintenance, like or with this yeah. predi- uh, predictive. It's based diagnostic. on the integrity system. Yes, as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean numbers don't lie, but there's a way to fu- to kind of skew the numbers to make it match whatever it is you're trying to do. And we see this happen all the time. Like uh, something could say like, "Oh, we're having a 10 percent fail rate," but instead of saying we're failing by 10 percent, they'll say, "Well, we're passing by 90 percent." So, thumbs up, everybody. Good to go. Wait, 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 wait. You just said the same thing, but in a different way. So how is this a good thing? <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, look, we're, our pass rate for this is, uh, is uh, we're at like 75%. Okay. But what's the pass rate for this specific inspection? Oh, the one where we do like five a month. Oh, yeah. All those pass were at 100%. Well, see, everything's not so bad then, is it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty interesting how you turned that around. I guess I applaud your efforts, but sh- sure. <laughs> huh. Well done. Well done. You, you know what? That takes talent. can knock you for it. Fantastic. And, and that, that, that's another one, too, you know, where. Uh, what's going to be the operational tolerance for this thing? Like, hey, it's trending towards bad, but <laughs> you know, it, it's within yeah. tolerance. And we're sitting here spinning positives out of negatives, I guess. But then, yeah. what's the point of why? Why do I? Why? Why then are we reporting, or do we need to collect this negative data if all you're going to do is is try to just ignore that and and find some positive in it, like? At this point, how about I just get a, a six-sided die with the numbers 94 through 100 on it, and I roll that, and that's whatever our percentages of success is. Yeah. Yeah, you'll always be, you'll always be in, the, in the green, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's like it's Dungeon the Dragons already, you know, like it's a fixed game. Yeah. Like, uh, is, is, that a, is that a dumpster fire behind you? It is. It is. But... But look at this new fire extinguisher, huh? Yeah, that's uh, it's nice and red and shiny. Uh, it looks like it's something made for small kitchen fires, though, and not something the size of a dumpster. Right. But we have a fire extinguisher. Sure, it's not the right size. No, no, what you're missing is this is brand new. 
it's serviced and we and, have it and it's compliant <laughs> and it's compliant yeah and you're like well go ahead and put out that fire then oh no you, you didn't ask for that you just you just asked if we had a fire bottle <laughs> right that 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 always makes me laugh too like but it's compliant sure but compliant to what <laughs> in, in the loosest sense of the word compliant yeah <laughs> it's like it's compliant yeah but is it adequate <laughs> goes back to that one thing it can either be it can either be working and what was it working and or fixed yeah or fixed <laughs> well i know i want it working fixed and safe to operate whoa 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 you want to throw whoa, safe whoa, in there whoa. now oh, oh man hold on <laughs> oh my god that's exactly how it is i feel like we got sidetracked on the predictive thing here um i mean i mean not really but <laughs> oh yeah i guess so <laughs> So but, ideally, but it, predictive maintenance solutions monitor onboard equipment in real time and analyze historical data. They use advanced analytics to predict which com- components will fail and when, so technicians can address potential issues before they become major problems. Well, what a novel concept! Wild, right? It just kind of like it kind of goes back to what we were saying. Like it kind of, you kind of got to know how to troubleshoot before you can start picking through yeah. numbers of data. Because I mean, oh, yeah, all that's all that's good in in predicting uh, predicting problems and maintenance and all that. If you know what you're looking for, yes. But if you don't, you know, know your ass from a hole in the ground, man, that data kind of does nothing for you, right? Or like, say, like if a nurse or a doctor were to show me like diagnostic data of a ultrasound or an EKG, I'm like I have no idea what the hell this thing's telling me. Is the flat line good? Is it bad? What's going on? Right, that's the same kind of pr- the same kind of numbers that's being spat out to you. Like, what is this? Yeah, <laughs> it goes back to that compliance thing. Yes, we have predictive maintenance. Awesome. Can you show me how it works? Oh, uh, oh. no, we can't. Why not? Well, nobody here knows how to read the data logs. So then, you don't have predictive maintenance. We do. We definitely have the program. Just nobody knows how to read it. Yeah. Okay. So we are compliant. Sure. Sure. I think you're missing, missing the purpose, purpose of it though. But uh, (laughs) yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Did we pass the audit? I mean, I can't fail you technically, but I I definitely can write an observation here on observation. That's it. Yeah. Fine. All day. I'll take that. (laughs) Right. Opportunity, air quote, opportunity for improvement, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we'll consider it. We'll consider this opportunity, but it's not a fail, right? So we'll do the good. cost benefit analysis on this and oh, make sure it's god. really worth investing the time and money. Oh in. my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I just threw up in my mouth saying that. <laughs> I know it was like my brain; it imploded. <laughs> I mean, at this point, like you said, you might as well just get a six headed die and then number it's 94 through 100 and like, uh, 97. Woo, we're still in the green. It's Yay. like, it, it's a rigged game you can't lose, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. And again, and again, like it sounds fantastic. The idea and the concept behind it is great. We understand why this is becoming such an innovative push, especially with these newer aircraft that's getting fitted with the latest and greatest of space age technology, as we, as we will would refer to. But again, it, it all dials down to uh, what can be read from it, how how good can we read it, and what can we do with it. And then, as MVP says, I'm I'm going to regret saying this: the cost benefit analysis is predictively going to be towards the better but again it all depends on how we're able to use it and actually do something about it because if we if we're just using it to just make charts and make all these fancy graphs and powerpoint presentations then we all we did was just made a fancy graph that's all we did we're not having any root cause or source uh isolation we're not having any real value streaming out of this. It's just a fancy picture. That's more or less what we're getting out of it. 
We turned numbers into graphs. That's all we did. (laughs) (laughs) I pick things up and I put them down. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I pick things up and I put it down. Yeah. um, Not to say that preventative maintenance is going to go away. If anything, they're probably going to increase because of stuff like this. No, preventative maintenance can't go away. It's it's sort of the fail safe of predictive maintenance. Yes. Um, you know, predictive maintenance seems like it's still there's no real set algorithm or set set code or set in of instructions that that's 100% kill shot every time. So, how do you when you when you can't get 100% accuracy uh on that, your your fail safe is your preventative. Right. And that's another question we should ask, like everyone out there, like what's what do you think the error rate's gonna be for this, right? Like what level of confidence are we gonna have that these things are actually reading correctly? Ooh. <laughs> right. Because everything yeah, I ha- mean I mean what what did Honeywell say? They had a a ninety nine percent predictive accuracy. When it came to the APUs, which is fairly accurate, but you know, I, I don't know. Is that how many APUs were used in that study? How many? It's a whole whole gambit of things. Right. Yeah. Because because yeah, like, oh, we're ninety percent, ninety nine percent efficient. Like, okay, what was your sample size, or what was your your performance metric? You know what I mean? Like. Like, uh, what did we test it to? Like, did we just turn it on and tell and see if it told us what was going on? Like, what sort of test did we put this through? You know, right. that yeah, it kind of goes back to what we were just saying with, hey, we this one thing we're at seventy five percent pass rate. What what about this specific thing? Oh, the one where we only do six of a month. Yeah, those those all passed. Oh, see, that's not so bad. So it's one of those. Hey, we did this. We employed this predictive, and we used two APUs, and we achieved ninety percent. Well, that's. I mean, yeah, cool. I mean, you proved that it, it works, but how, now throw 200 APUs in there or 400 APUs in there, right? There's a carrier out there that has over 400 aircraft mm-hmm. under their banner. How does that compare with 400 APUs? Right. And, and, then, and, and then what's your accuracy rate at that point, you know? Right. And then do we try this out with aged APUs? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or what's the age of the APU? Uh, yeah. Oh well, they're all brand new off the line under a hundred hours. Mm, not, yeah. ac- not not super predictive. How about that old ratted out poopty sitting in the back corner over there? That's, <laughs> uh, it looks like it's made out of a Folgers can. It's so old, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for everyone else out there, if you have some kind of answers or you or you're more savvy on this predictive maintenance uh, initiative, please by all means hit us up. Tell us, like. What sort of test do you think they're going to be running? What sort of uh, predictability you think it's averaging at? Because, yeah, one says 99%, but as a whole, it probably looks more like 90. Who knows, right? Or Mm -hmm. is the technology even advanced enough to get a decent metric out of all these different predictive maintenance um, equipment, right? And then, because, you know, like uh, different companies, they're going to try to have their own spin on it. Like, oh, ours is 99.99% efficient. Oh, well, yeah, where ours is 99.9996% accurate. <laughs> you know? Well, it's going to be it's going to be Amazon reviews. How many stars does this one have? Well, it's got five stars. Yeah, but only only 500 people reviewed it. This one over here has got four and a half stars, but but 2000 people have reviewed it. Hmm. Might want to go with a 2000 one, you know? Right. At least it's more accurate, right? <laughs> or supposedly yeah, more large, accurate. Larger sample size. Yeah. We're, we're definitely going into some math with this one. But then again, with something predictive, you are basically involving math. Unless, again, you have a crystal ball or some, kind, some version of a fortune teller behind you who can sear into the future. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or just, just take some drugs, you know what I mean? And just float around like a... Like the, what's it called? The, holy shit, I'm blanking. Um, from 300, you know what I mean? The, the Oracle, that's it, the Oracle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Jesus. The Oracle. Uh, that was bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> 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 Just take some drugs and be like the Oracle. Like, 
No, I'll tell you whatever you want. Just give me more drugs. <laughs> it's terrible. Put another coin in the machine. Yep. <laughs> uh, final thoughts on this MVP. Uh, good luck to everybody uh, who's predicting the future like we are. <laughs> um, it's not an easy thing to do. You won't. Uh, you, you'll you struggle with it. I mean, as good as we all think we might be, we're still going to miss something. So take your best crack at it. Uh, nobody can fault you for trying to make, uh, make it better. And uh, if you can reduce the uh, cost and downtime by, by even, even a percent, you, you've, you got success, right? Yes. And again, like uh, what MVP was saying, like you can have your numbers down to a T, you can have your eyes down to a dot. All your numbers are solid. It's all within that 99% ratio, but as of all things, you know, life happens and sometimes they throw curveballs at it and it just throws your entire model out of whack. So just understand that those kind of stuff, those kind of interactions and those factors will play into effect regardless of how great your, your uh, numbers are. But that's why it's called predictive because we predict it, it's going to do this, but is it really going to happen? Who knows? Nope. But yeah, again, it goes what, back to was the was the part made on a on a Monday, a Wednesday, or a Friday? You know what I mean? Exactly. And but tell us what you think. Like, uh, what sort of stuff have you? Do you know about predictive maintenance? What sort of accuracy you think it's going to do? What sort of tests they are running, or what they should run? Well, and all things of that nature. Hit us up on our social medias. Hit us up on our website. Tell, reach out to us. Whichever way is easiest for you as to what you guys feel about this subject. Um, on that note, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, we sorry, we apologize for that gap in that one week's episode, but we're going to do our very best to keep on going and keep on moving. And if you haven't heard already, we've, we've been contestants again on the second annual veteran podcast award. So if you see it on our social medias or if you see it on our website, please vote for us on that. Uh, awards. This will be our second time going. And we are in three categories again this year. Uh, that being aviation. Uh, the second one, I think, is like best Marine Corps. And then the third one is best overall. Please vote us on all three. And, and by all means, uh, check out the rest of the competition. You may find something that resonates with you to you, to the, um, whichever one it sounds best to you. But please vote for us. No, I'm being biased. Please vote for us. <laughs> <laughs> And again, th on that note, thanks again, everybody. And thank you for listening. Bye, everyone. We would like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to make episodes, maintain our gear, and create merch for all of our listeners. With special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Dan Schubert, Ryan Frushauer, Kyle Keir, Caleb Stockhill, Jenny Dignan, and Jennifer Brofer. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. If you like our show, please support us on Patreon. You'll receive awesome perks such as access to our private Discord, discounts on and early access to merch, first glimpse of our comics and other projects, and so much more. Visit our shop at cancelformaintenance.com and grab some swag to show off both your support for us and your prowess as an aircraft technician. If you have suggestions for the show or have a guest recommendation to be on the show, send us a line on our contact us section at our website and do, we will do what we can to get your ideas and or your recommendations on the show. You can also follow us on social media, such as on Facebook at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at Kanks, that's C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, Twitter at CXMX Podcast, and now you can catch us on Tapas, where you can view our latest comics. Check out our affiliate, RockwellTime.com, for watches and eyewear that support both your sporty and classy lifestyles. Use the code CX4MX that's the number 4MX to save 10% off your total purchase. Thank you all again for your listenership and support, and we will see you all next time.